Hello, I'm Dan DeJager, and this is Changing the Game. So, I want you to think of a question. Think of the answer to this question. Why did you decide to become a physical educator? Remember the answer to that question. We're going to get back to it. We're going to get back to it at the end of this presentation. So this presentation is going to be a little bit different. It's kind of going to be a little bit like a buffet, right? We have a little Indian buffet plate. I like my Indian buffet. I don't think we're going to be having it for a little while, but it sure is good. Anyways, it's going to be a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Most of it's hopefully good, um, but there's a little bit of different things in this presentation that we're going to talk about. And so just kind of keep that in mind. There's going to be some things that you're like, hey, that's great. I want to go check out more of that. And that's what it's there for. Go find out more information. And then there's going to be other pieces that you're like, yeah, I already knew that. I already get that. And that's okay too. But hopefully somewhere in here, there's something for everybody, right? Um, so let's start off. Let's start thinking about the PE and gym teachers we see in the TV, on the TV, television, um, or in movies, right? We often get portrayed as this aggressive, mean, angry person. Our profession is just miserable. We look, we look over here. We have, we have the coach, the, the PE coach from Wonder Years on the far side, and then we have the Simpsons coach, and then we have, uh, boy, that movie, Mr. Woodcock, and then over here we have the coach the physical education teacher, the PE teacher, whatever, from, from Clueless. This is what we are. This is how we're portrayed in the media, right? And apparently, apparently, if you check out these pictures, we all hold the ball in the same hand in the same way. doesn't matter what kind of ball it is. If it's a basketball, red rubber ball, you hold it like this, like you're going to throw it at somebody. That's what PE teachers do, right? You got to hold the ball like that, like you're just going to hit somebody hard. That's what the media thinks. That's what the media thinks of. Well, in real life, studies confirm that those who have a negative experience in physical education classes grow up to hate exercise. It's a real problem. So we are actually like this in a PE class. Those students are more likely to grow up and not want to exercise. However, those that loved physical education classes tend to grow into active adults. Hmm. So this is what it comes down to. If you love physical education, you're more likely to be active. If you don't, you're less likely to be active. Pretty big responsibility here, right? And it all falls on us. We're not just actors in a movie, we're the real thing. Hmm. What are we gonna do about that? We've gotta change the game a little bit. So a couple summers ago, I took my son uh, to Legoland. And in San Diego, we were visiting uh, we were visiting some family down there, and we we're at Legoland, and they have all these rides and everything. And then there was this room, and in this room, you could sit and play with Legos at Legoland. Well, my son sat down. Let's picture my son right there. He sat down at a table and he started playing with Legos. I'm like, why are you playing with Legos? We're at Legoland. You should be riding rides and taking advantage of the opportunity to be here at Legoland. You can play with Legos when you're at home, right? And that's what I thought. And then I looked at the rest of the room, I'm like, well, that's probably what the other kids thought too. And that's probably what their, their parents thought as well. Um, that's why it's an empty room and he's the only one sitting there playing Legos. So we let him build some stuff with the Legos for a little while. But here's what he did not know. On the other side of this wall over here was another room. Um, and on that other side of that other room was something very different. So we had Legos in this room right here. And on the other side of the room, video games. Now, these kids were also at Legoland. They also could have been riding rides and stuff, but instead they chose to play video games. On the exact wall, that wall is the only thing that separates the Lego room for the video game room. And I was so proud of my son for choosing those Legos over those video games. I later found out that he didn't know that the video games were there. And if he had known that the video games were there, well, he probably would have chosen them too, right? We did end up going later, several months later, um, again to Legoland because we were visiting family again. We had a pass, and so we went back 
And this time we did go to the video game room because my now my son knew that it was there. And we went in there and we probably spent like 15, 20 minutes in there. But there was a group of kids right next to us. And they said, okay, we should go now. They had been in there for over four hours. So they went to Legoland to play video games. Wow. So here's the thing. That's some of our students. That's some of the students that we work with. That's some of the students that we teach. So we have to meet the students where they are. Our job is to teach the students we have, not the ones we would like to have, not the ones we used to have, those we have right now, all of them. So if students are into video games, we have to build that in somehow into our curriculum. We have to give them that option or bring it together. And maybe into the shelter in place we've been in, that's an opportunity to look at things a little bit differently and try to build those opportunities in, right? If students are into different things, if they're into getting out and about and walking and moving, then let's start doing some activities they might be into. Let's bring out some disc golf. Let's, you know, bring out some hacky sack. These are out and about students, right? If, if they're into the team sports, they have that opportunity. Let's give them some choice. Let's build in something into our curriculum for everyone so that they all have that opportunity to love physical education, which will also encourage them to be active and exercise later in life. And that's what we're trying to get to. So that's one thing we can think about is the activities in our curriculum themselves, right? I had the same reaction you did. We're at Legoland. Why would you be sitting here playing video games? But that's what some of our students are into. So there's some other ways to do that. Can we do some, some just dance or some we just dance or something um, as part of the dance thing? Can we build in some kind of technology where they're keeping track of steps or they're keeping track of heart rate or they're, there's some Pokemon Go kind of going on. We can do those kind of things, especially in the situation that we are right now. So we use this as an opportunity to challenge ourselves and how we can reach those students. So obviously it's about what we do with our students, but it's also about how we do it. How do we approach our kids? I was down in San Diego again and went to this mall and I was blown away because at this mall they had an Amazon bookstore. I was a little thrown off because I was like Amazon brick and mortar not just online apparently. So I went inside to check out what real life Amazon looks like um, and found some books. Well I saw this book sitting here. Well go see the principal true, true tales from the school trenches. I just happened to open it up, chapter 13, where it says social emotional learning. Positive culture starts with the grown-ups. And then it talks about, it talks about how the teachers at a school site, the staff at a school site, really are the models for the students. So that's one thing to consider. How we treat each other in front of school, in front of students, they're gonna see that. If we want them to be respectful to one another, we need to be respectful to each other as well. Something to consider, it's something to think about. Because um, again, social emotional learning, is a big piece. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it in the news lately, but it's gonna be a very, very big piece in California anyway, a big focus in our education environment. And it really starts with us. It starts with us as educators and how we treat each other. So, I want, you to, I want you to think about what kind of attitude do you have with your classes? What kind of attitude do you have towards your classes during the school day? Maybe it depends on the time of day. Maybe in the morning, everything's great. Maybe in the afternoon, not so much. You know, sixth grade, seventh grade, they tend to be the toughest, right? So. When you're in your classes, you tend to be a vulture. Now we know the vulture. The vulture is gonna look for anything along the side of the road, dead or decaying, that they can go and pick on and eat. And they're looking for the bad things. They're looking for the things that are in trouble, right? Now, this is an easy position to fall into as a physical education teacher. We've all done that, and I've done that. It's hard, 
right? Oftentimes you have a class that's overwhelming you, sixth or seventh period, 95 degrees outside, and they're just like, choo, choo. And you're like, hey, you, put that ball down. Hey, you, come over here. Hey, you, why are you late to class, right? And that's what you're looking at. You're like that vulture, just finding the things that are going wrong. Now, we have a choice. Vultures don't have a choice, but we, we could be the hummingbird. Now, a hummingbird, they're looking for the sweet things. They're looking for the good things. They're looking for the what's going right. And they're looking at them, mm, that's sweet and tasty, right? So we have that option too. We can go into our classes and look for the things that are going correct, things that are going well. Hey, thank you for being ready to go. Thank you for being in class on time. I really appreciate it. You're here every day. High five. Well, maybe not high five. We're not allowed to do those anymore. But hey, nice job. Thank you, so and so. Right? One on ones. Hey, I. You know what? Great job doing this when you were when you were throwing that disc. You you followed you followed through and it went right to your target. Nice job. Even with our skill feedback, even with our cue feedback, we can look for the positives, right? And try to sandwich, if there's something that needs a correction, sandwich that in there. But aim for the sweetness. Again, why do we want to be sweet? Why do we want to be kind? As hard as it is, if we can keep this into the back of our mind, the more we do this, the more students are going to enjoy our classes, which means the more likely they will exercise when they're older. So, we also must remember the students are people first. I have pictures of three of my former students right here, all of them absolutely amazing people. Jackie on the far left, Armand in the middle, Taryn on the right. And those are folks that entered my life. I was blessed to have them come into my life as a teacher. And they were my students and my athletes, Armand anyway. And I chose to be a hummingbird with them. It wasn't always easy, but because of that, I was able to be part of their lives and help them and support them in their dreams and their goals. They did this all on their own, where they've gone and what they've done. I mean, you know, Jackie used to hide in the bathroom. She didn't even want to be a part of PE class in the very beginning, you know. Uh, when I first started teaching. And now, now it's amazing what she's doing. And I'm still very much a part of her, a part, of, part of her life. And part of that was the approach um, that she was opening up to me, but also that I was a hummingbird, not a vulture looking for what was wrong. Look for what's right in kids. Kids are always looking to, they're looking for support. And we can give them that opportunity to get that support. So, since you're looking, be open to it. Be the hummingbird. All right. So, I am lovable and capable. Most of our students, when they go to bed at night, they are lovable and capable. Now, during the night, during the next day, things happen. And those things may happen before they get to us. So, let's pretend now that you're a student. You're a kid, you're a teenager, you're a middle school student. Let's make you a middle school student, seventh grade, right? You go to bed, the next morning you wake up. You haven't been getting much sleep because your parents have been fighting. It starts to weigh on you. And because you didn't get much sleep, you woke up late and you didn't get any breakfast. Mm. That's a problem. Now you're hungry. Then when you get to school, you heard from a friend, someone posted something negative about you online. Man, someone said something negative about you online. You heard about it. It never feels good, especially as a young adult, teenager, and adolescent trying to find yourself. Then, as you go through your school day, you fail the math test that you actually tried to study for. You actually studied for it, and then you failed anyway. 
Then later, next period, your phone went off in class and the teacher took it, took your phone. You didn't mean to leave it on, but it went off. That's the rule, the teacher took the phone. Now they have your property. And then you were late to PE because you had troubles with your locker and you had to use the bathroom. The teacher then yelled at you and made you do push-ups. And then you said to the teacher, F you, I'm not doing your push-ups. Why? Because all of these other things led up to that moment. So we have to remember not to take things personally from our kids, from our students. They'll let you have it. And believe me, they've let me have it. Um, but oftentimes it's not about us. It's about everything that happened before they got to us. Right? So we keep this in mind. We keep this in mind because students have needs. They have basic needs. And when those needs aren't met, then it affects them. We look here. Everyone, Maslow's our hierarchy of needs. Everyone has these needs. Physiological needs. Air, water, food, shelter, sleep, clothing, reproduction, physiological needs. We think of our student right here. They were already missing some basic physio physiological needs. They didn't get breakfast that morning and they didn't get much sleep that night. Okay, So they're already down a little bit. Safety needs, health, property. Yep, one of the teachers took their cell phone. That's their property. Student doesn't feel safe. It doesn't matter what how we feel about it, right? It might be the rule. And it might be a rule in your class if you don't have a cell phone. And I get that, right? They can be a real distraction. But from that student's point of view, that's their property. Love and belonging. Now, you have friends, good friends, right? So you think, and then someone says something about you online. Well, that's going to affect you. Esteem self-esteem. You spent time studying for that test and then you failed it anyway. There goes your self-esteem. All these things lead up to that self-actualization, the desire to become the most that one can be. That can't happen until these other pieces happen. So if you're missing even one or two of these little things, it can really build up. And so often that happens with our students and we don't see that other piece. So this brings me to a story. Uh, about seven years ago, I transferred to a school, um, Encina High School in Sacramento, California. I was in the district. Uh, I had been teaching at another school um, for several years and done some other consulting work for the district and some other pieces, but really had a pretty good, pretty good position at my former site. Um, and then I decided to transfer to Encina. 70% of the staff, 70% of the teachers had left the school in 2012. Not 30%, 70%. Um, it was a challenging environment in that time. 80% of the students are low SES. In reality, it's much higher than that. It's just what's identified, but it's much higher than 80%. Homeless, 12%. Again, a number that in reality is much higher. Consider homeless if you're couch surfing, if you're just staying in places that aren't actually yours. And so many of our students did. Students were running the school. There were gangs, all kinds of gangs. And there was aggression towards staff. One of the stories I heard before I went over was about the weightlifting class actually circling um, the one male physical education teacher and threatening to fight him. And this was real. This is a real school and a real place and it was real bad. And so when 70% of the staff quit and I voluntarily decided, let's go over here and see how this goes, a lot of people called me an idiot, um, but it was one of the best decisions I ever made. As we started the program, it ended up being me and a few other new department members. There really wasn't a department left. There was a, uh, a health teacher who caught half-time health and half-time physical education. She was the only PE teacher that was left when we got there. Other than that, we, were, we started a new physical education program. When we arrived, 30 to 50% of the students would be physically active in class. And maybe 30% of them were actually learning the lesson that you were teaching. What's the difference? Well, you had students who were like, okay, we're doing basketball, we're practicing passing. And then they would just play a game, right? 
they were being active, but they weren't actually learning what they should have been learning. Um, there were 111 referrals for defiance from August to February that first year. So 111 referrals for defiance. That's quite a bit. Um, that's students telling teachers, no, you am not doing this, I'm not doing that. 156 office referrals from physical education in 2013 to 2014. As far as physical fitness tests, and we all have our thoughts and our points of views about physical fitness tests, but there's some data here. In 2016, 7.8% passed five out of the six tests. So a couple of years in, this is how many of the students passed five out of six of those tests. Okay. We looked at this situation and we tried to figure out what to do. First thing we did was listen to students. Where were they coming from? Why were they so angry? Why were they so defiant? Why were those fitness test scores so low? But what did they need? What did the students need? We had to adjust to meet the needs of the students. What we found out they needed was a focus on social emotional learning. And really a big piece of that was focusing on grit, overcoming obstacles, persevering to overcome obstacles to reach your goals. And that was a big focus of mine. It was a big focus of our departments was showing grit and writing reflections and setting goals around units and how you were gonna overcome obstacles to reach those goals and reflecting on those goals and keeping a journal of sorts as you went through and reflecting at the end of the unit on how you did and thinking about who you're working with and how you're working with others. That was the focus. We also had to work collaborative as a team of teachers. We had to develop a program. We had to develop a vision for what we wanted our students to be. And we spent a whole day developing a vision and a core purpose, an entire day to make sure that what we had was right and so that we had something we could always come back to. And if whatever we did, whatever decision we were making didn't reach our vision or our purpose, then why were we doing it? But we needed that. We needed that for the students, the students that we had, students that were at Encina, our students. After doing all this, here's what we got to. Now it took us about five years, four to five years to get to this point. But from 30 to 50% being physically active, 99% of the class physically active. 30% learning physical education to 95% learning physical education. 111 referrals for defiance, nine referrals for defiance. 156 office referrals to 33. Those are some Discipline comes in big. If you, your administration sees that you're sending students to the office all the time, or they're going up to the office for office referrals because of their behavior, often that reflects on you as a teacher. So again, this wasn't an easy program and we had to meet twice a week uh, as a department this entire time and constantly adjust and constantly listen to our students and constantly work on it. But look where we got to. And this was all focused on that social emotional learning piece. And after just a couple of years, we talk as a department, do not focus. We are not worried about the fitness tests. That is not our main focus right now. If we do this, the fitness tests will come. And they did. It was unbelievable. Fitness testing results went from 7.8% to 49.4%, passing five out of the six tests. And those were legitimate tests. Like they were following the rules and the rigor. I'm actually in charge of the fitness test for our district. And I wanted to make sure that it was legitimate testing that was happening. And it was, and to see that kind of an increase because students felt more positive in our environment because they trusted their teachers, because they trusted our system and because they were part of our culture, there was an improvement. So one of the things that we did, and we'll get into all the different strategies, but one of the things that we did as teachers is during the class period, we would check in with students, with students that were having a tough time. So if they were having a tough time in our class, we'd have them go out, and we would go meet with them. Okay, later, this actually became the job of, uh, we had an instructional assistant who would do this for us, which made it a lot nicer. Before then, it was us as teachers. But we check in with that student, and it was a target. And in this target, if you were good to go, you'd point to the middle and say, hey, where would you put yourself on this target right now, as far as how your day is going? And the student would say, I'm like, would you be on the, on the edge, or kind of dealing with life? Or are you good to go? And if they said good to go, that meant they were good to go. Hey, so what's going on with you today? I noticed you don't, uh, you're not, you're not dressed to participate. 
your shoes, you know, you can't wear those shoes. You know how you have shoes you can borrow from us if that's the problem. So why aren't you wearing your shoes today? Hey, I just forgot them today. I'll bring them tomorrow. Other than that, I'm good. Okay, you're good to go? Yep, I'm good to go. Middle of the target. Boom. Okay, we got this solved. Problem solved. Tomorrow, you'll be good. Okay, what's the yellow one? Uh, why aren't you participating today? Well, my friend said something to me last period, and I'm still not happy about it. I'm just not in the mood today. You're going to be okay for tomorrow? Yeah, I think so. It's just, I, I just can't do this today. Okay, that's fine. If you need anything, let me know. Okay, all right. Dealing with life, but I think I'll be okay. Okay, in the yellow. Or on the edge. So, hey, how are you doing today? I know you should not, you're not wanting to do this. You kind of seem like you're a little on edge. You know, the student puts himself, where are you on this? I'm on the edge. Okay, why are you on the edge? Notice you've been on the edge. Well, um, it turns out one of my students, one of the other students uh, took my cell phone two periods ago. I still can't find it. I think I know who it is. I'm going to kick their butt after class. Um, and they're going to get it from me. Whoa. Okay. Now this is my opportunity as a teacher to be more than a teacher, but to be a support. And so then I can contact administration. I can contact counseling and get them involved before the student starts a fight with another student over the cell phone. Okay. So, uh, it's just a little target. It's just a little check-in that you can use with the students. It gives them a third point. So it's not you directly asking the questions, but then they can, they can look on the target and pick what their answer is. I got the idea from the documentary Paper Tigers. If you've never seen it, um, there's actually one of these targets hanging behind the uh, principal. I kind of just modified it and made my own thing out of it. But anyways, it seems to work. So we talked about checking in with students, being kind towards students. We should also talk about what might trigger a student so that they do become angry. Why? For some reason, when we say why, it always kind of comes off as aggressive and insinuating. Why did you do this? Why did you forget your clothes? Why aren't you on your number? So I've noticed if you avoid saying the word why, it helps. What prevented you from bringing your clothes today? Well, this happened, this happened. Okay. Something to consider, just eliminate the word why. Yelling at a student one-on-one. -on -one. Now, <laughs> We have our classes and you have to be loud with your classes. And sometimes you might have to yell at them to get them where you need them to go or whatever. That's a class, that's not a student. If you yell at a student one-on-one, -on -one, you're asking for a battle and ultimately you won't win that battle. Don't yell at a student one-on-one. -on -one. It will trigger a student. Getting in their space, same idea, right? <sighs> I unfortunately have worked with folks in the past um, it was a classroom teacher and the student and the teacher went back and forth. Next thing you knew, both the student and the teacher went outside the classroom. Like, what? Yeah. You yell at a student, that's going to trigger them. And then if you get, they yell back at you and then you get in their space, now you've got an altercation on your hands. And you're partially at fault of that. So think about that piece. Okay. Those are some pretty hardcore ones right there. But even using exercise as punishment, right? We want kids to love exercise, not hate it. So don't use it as punishment. And pretending to know where they're coming from. Hey, I don't know where my students were coming from. I had to admit that right off the bat. I didn't know what it was like to be black third generation poverty in that neighborhood, right? I knew what it was like to live in that neighborhood. I used to live in that neighborhood. I can identify on that piece, but I couldn't identify on those other pieces, right? I don't know what it's like to be a refugee um, from another country and to still have shrapnel in my arm like some of my students did. I don't know what that's like. So I don't know what it's like to not know the language and to be an immigrant. That was my students. I can't pretend to know where they're coming from. I can just listen and try to learn. Putting students in an embarrassing situation, just don't do it. Um, if you highlight a student, you spotlight them, that could trigger them. Okay. So keep in mind, you know, when you're picking volunteers, um, try to make them volunteers and not put someone in a bad spot. So when we talk about preventing potentially embarrassing situations, we talk about a few scenarios here. Now, I grew up, uh, I did not have a good experience in physical education class. My PE classes, I hated them. That's, I was a skinny scrawny kid. I was sick. Um, in elementary school all the way through middle school 
and it uh with my asthma it was really bad and i just couldn't i couldn't participate a lot and then when i finally could i was bullied a lot i was bullied a lot in middle school and high school so there were some situations in pe class that actually made it worse and pe was the hardest class for me captains picking teams don't have captains pick teams one time literally it came down to me and the kid with the broken arm i tell the story all the time it's a true story the captain picked the key tacked and kicked the team with the picked the kid with the broken arm and the other team got stuck with me okay i was picked last the kid with the broken arm for softball all right i won't forget that right that's an embarrassing situation and my self-esteem was not feeling so good after that fitness testing one at a time in front of a group don't do this i know it's hard i know it's hard to do fitness testing especially when you've got all these students have them all doing something and pull them out one-on-one -on -one. have them walk laps pull them out boom do it right there have them playing a game boom pull them out right there right instructions not happening it's better than testing one one at a time in front of a group supervise them yes but don't pick one at a time in front of a group um you can take those walls sometimes those uh those if you don't have a wall but put them behind a wall or Take a gymnastics mat sometimes you can fold those into pieces and you make a little wall out of it pull them behind there and do the test um, while you pull them out oh my gosh it makes a big difference if they have privacy um, students will be way more likely to perform better and that's one reason why i do think our fitness test results went up over time as we made them feel safe during the fitness test being forced into an aggressive intimidating activity so you don't want to force students into an, an activity like uh, i don't know dodgeball <laughs> or what I used to we used to play slaughter ball when I was in middle school. It was it was legit red rubber ball, hardcore. Um, it was called slaughter ball. Hey, and I tell you, I could dodge like a madman. I was awesome. I was so skinny, no ball could hit me anyway. But then it'd be left with me and a ball. Maybe if I was lucky, and like five other guys on the other side who just pummeled me. Right. So we want to kind of avoid that situation. That could be pretty negative for a lot of folks. <laughs> negatively calling out a student in front of a group so if you don't want to call a student out in front of a group um, negatively because that's going to be an embarrassing situation for them right so try to avoid this you know also to go with that negatively calling out instead of a student in front of a group it also goes back to the idea of highlighting a student right for a volunteer i, I remember we did wrestling one one time and a student, a sixth grader, was in sixth grade. One of the sixth graders took my watch and said, hey, you want my watch back? You have to wrestle me in front of the rest of the class. Well, I knew I was going to lose, but I wanted my watch back. So I did it anyway, right? But, and the teacher just had the students just sitting around the circle and one pair at a time would go out and wrestle, okay? That's not, A, that's not effective teaching, but B, now you're, you're highlighting kids and you put them in a bad situation, right? We want to try to avoid that, okay? For more ideas, check out www.supportrealteachers.org. We have some fantastic uh, strategies you can use there to kind of avoid those embarrassing situations, but also to just promote quality physical education. Embarrassment and bad stress are going to produce cortisol. High cortisol causes high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, fatigue, impaired brain function. So we don't want these things for our students. Our job is to eliminate these things. So think about that. Eliminate embarrassment, eliminate bad stress. Instead, let's create some good chemicals. Endorphins, through regular exercise, giving, mindfulness, laughter. Serotonin, through aerobic exercise, physical human contact, when we can again. Dopamine, exercise, listening to music. We can create these positive chemicals in our classes. That's our job. In a research study, those that were lowest in the lowest quartile for positive emotions at the mean age of 22 were found to die on average 10 years earlier than those in the highest quartile. That's real. We want to help people live longer, happier, healthier lives. So we can do that by creating some good chemicals in our classes. For more information on that, check out Simon Sinek's uh, Leaders Eat Last. You can find that on YouTube. Joe Bailey has some stuff on Twitter at Love Fied. You can check her stuff out. She Her pinned tweet last I checked was uh, getting the correct dose of physical education and she kind of goes over that and how we can do that in our class. So another thing we can consider is love languages. Now, we often think about this with significant others or friends or family. 
but with our students too. They need to know that they're loved. They need to know we care about them. So that every student has a different love language or they have different love languages and so do we. So their love languages might be words of affirmation. They really thrive on those positive words. And if a student really thrives on those positive words, you'll hear it because they'll probably be the ones who are like, hey, I love your shirt, Mr. DJ, or hey, I love your shoes or whatever, right? Words of affirmation, that might be their love language. So try it back. Hey, I really like your shoes. Or, hey, I really, I really appreciated how you helped me with that equipment earlier. That was great. Or send a positive email home or make a phone call home to their parents. They would really appreciate that. That's their love language. Or it could be acts of service. Maybe they are the student who helps me with the equipment. I need someone to help me with the equipment. Boom, they're on it every time. Hmm. Maybe it's because acts of service is their love language. What can you do for them? How can you help them out, right? Maybe they drop their stuff, their backpack falls open, stuff falls on the ground. You help them pick it up. Acts of service is their love language. Maybe they need some help with a math question. You try to help them the best you can. Acts of service is their love language. So you wanna show them that you care about them, that you love them. And so you find their language. Receiving gifts, this is that kid who gives you something. You're like, why did you bring me a rock? You brought me a rock. Okay, great, right? That's their love language, rocks. No, receiving gifts. So maybe there's something they really, if you have some kind of positive re reward system with like bucks or something in the system, you can give them those positive bucks. Um, and that is one way that they receive gifts, right? So, and so you're trying to give them something or maybe it's a positive note, then they're getting a gift and they're getting words of affirmation. Um, you know, maybe it's just a little token of something around the holidays, whatever it is, but gifts could be a big deal to them. Quality time. Some of our students just want to spend time with us. These are the ones that if you're in a locker room situation, um, they'll be hanging out with you in the locker room. They'll get changed to come hang out with you or they'll hang out with you and then they'll get changed, right? They want to come check in with you and talk to you. They just want time. Um, they're the ones in the middle of the lesson. They're hanging out with you. They just want to hang out with you and talk, right? They want time. Quality time means something to them. Beat them to it. Spend some time with them. Check in with them first. That way they know you care about them. And it's not just the other way around. Spend some time with them. Go out, meet them on their turf. Find them at lunchtime. Find them during recess. Hang out with them. Play a game with them. All right, that's their love language. Physical touch. Now, this is one we have to be careful of right now with our current situation, but for some of our kids, this is their love language. We know this because they're the ones leaning on you. You're like trying to teach and they walk up and they start leaning on you and you're like, okay, <sighs> you know, but if you can give them a fist bump or a high five or whatever, that shows that you love them. Now, right now we can't do any of those things. So physical touch is kind of off and that's gonna be tough for some of our kids. Because for, for a lot of them, that's their love language, and they don't have that. So be looking for their backup love language and hope they have one. Okay, because our, our students are missing that, right? Want to love our students, want them to have a positive environment, want them to enjoy physical education class. Learning these love languages helps. Uh, you can check out Gary Chapman, www.5lovelanguages.com for more information on those. Some good books to read on that as well. So I talk about all these things, you're like, this is great. But what if I don't ever see my students in the next year? Or over the next several months. What can I do now? Well, even if you're teaching it over, over a distance right now, things that you can do to change the game, to change the perception of physical education teachers um, so that we don't match what they see in the movies and, and television stuff is be engaged as a teacher. Be engaged with your students, right? Uh, my son's district, unfortunately, and I pushed very hard against it and sent letters and part of board meetings and everything, but they want to eliminate physical education specialists at the elementary level. And it's a sad, sad situation. Um, I talked to one of the other elementary specialists. I, I know him. He's actually one of my former student teachers. And so, you know, he was telling me everything he's been doing while they've been doing distance learning, this crisis learning. And he's been setting up videos, making these videos where he's teaching them different skills. And then he's posting it for all of them. And then he's dropping in on the class meetings. And he's running things in the class meetings and helping the teachers. And he's totally involved. But he says, I have coworkers, I have other physical education teachers, other PE teachers, and they aren't doing anything. He said, well, we haven't been told to do anything, so we're just kind of hanging out. Well, now they've decided they don't need PE teachers. And that may have contributed to it. So be engaged as a teacher, be engaged as a physical education teacher. Check in with your kids. That's the next piece. Invite students to be physically active. 
don't force students to be physically active when they're not there because you don't know their living situation, you don't know their living environment, um, you don't know what's going on, but invite them. Send them invitations to be physically active. Send them videos to be physically active. Send them opportunities to be physically active. Stay engaged with them. Don't force them because it can't, it's not always possible in that environment and you're not there to check in on that environment. Next, send positive emails to parents and kids. When you do have a student who's engaging with you, even over a distance through Zoom calls or email, that's awesome. They're turning their work in, even though you don't see them daily. Send a positive email, say, hey, I, I really appreciate how Tabby is engaged with stuff. She completed the last assignment. I know she showed the last Zoom call where she did some exercises together. That is awesome, that is amazing. And send those positive emails. Then those parents and those kids are gonna see you as a different physical education teacher than the ones they see in the movie. And lastly, check in with kids. Check in with kids to see how they're doing. This is a tough time. This is a really tough time um, with students. It doesn't matter what grade they are. They're missing their peers, they're missing their friends. And it's okay, it's okay to deviate from talking PE all the time to just check in with them. How are you doing? How are you doing this week? What have you been doing? Oh, you've been playing video games? What video games have you been playing? Oh, that's awesome. Oh, wow, that's pretty cool. That sounds like a great game. Wow. Hey, you know, and then that's an opportunity to bring up some other video game where maybe they can be more physically active. But it's just checking in with them to see how they're doing these times. And that's okay too. Check in with our kids, right? They know that you care about them, that you love them, um, that you're they're important to you, they're gonna have a better experience. And that's gonna help, that's gonna help get rid of our image more than anything else. So let's go back to the question we asked to start. Why did you become a physical educator? For most of us, it's because we had someone in an activity environment, whether that was a physical education teacher or a coach, and we felt successful in that environment, and we felt cared for in that environment by that coach, by that physical education teacher. It was because of that actions, the actions of that individual that we went into this profession. For most of us, that's why we did it. There was someone else there. I know for me, it was my cross country coach in high school. Suddenly I felt good at something and I had someone who cared, right? So the reason we became a physical educator, we wanna give that reason to every kid in all of our classes. And it starts with the way we make them feel. Maya Angelou said, I've learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And as physical educated, education teachers, we want to change the negative views in the media and on television, and how we're portrayed and thoughts on physical education. It has to start with us and how we make people feel. Thank you for listening to our presentation. Uh, for more information, you can contact me. My email is ddjager at yahoo.com. You can email me directly. I can help you the best I can. Uh, my Twitter handle is at the PE challenge and there you will actually find a weekly challenge during the school year where I challenge physical education teachers um, towards quality physical education by giving a weekly challenge. It's really simple. It might be just like, hey, give, you know, uh, 10 high fives this day or whatever it is. Um, no high fives, not that one. Just kidding. Um, but it could be something with uh, having a positive attitude towards your students. It could have something with limiting instructional time getting students moving more, whatever it is, just simple little challenges, weekly challenges. Follow me on Twitter to get more of those. You can also check out my brand new website, www.thepechallenge.com to find plenty of resources on distance learning, uh, adventure racing. It's another one of the things that I talk about a lot. Um, changing the game, how we change negative views of our, uh, of our profession um, and some other pieces there. If you're, if you're interested in consulting or present, presenting or any of those other pieces, information is there as well but it's just a website where you can find tons of resources um, and direct you to some other sites to help you out in this challenge that we all have as physical education teachers. Now, you can also check out the Shape America blog articles, um, five ways to change how other teachers view physical education, and then five ways to change how students view PE classes. You'll see some of these ideas there as well. All right, thank you so much. Thank you for being with me today. And thank you for being in this profession and making it better. Thank you for watching this session from EPEW 2020. 
We're saving the next few minutes for you to ask those final questions before we log off. If you have any questions afterwards, please reach out to the presenter or send a message to EPEW through our website. Don't forget that we have more amazing sessions going on. Head over to our website, epew-cp.weebly.com, and look for the virtual EPEW 2020 tab. You can also access the presentations on YouTube by typing in the hashtag EPEW2020. We'd like to thank the amazing EPEW committee for all their hard work over this past year. This event would not have been possible without their dedication, commitment, and volunteering their time to providing high quality professional development. Don't forget about our other events like our socials and share times. Links can be found on our website. Remember our motto for EPEW, come to learn, leave as family. Thank you for joining our family today.